now, I would like to uh, start by welcoming everybody. My name is Michael Phillip. I'm the co-chair of uh, Bhutan Foundation of the Board of Directors. Um, I want to welcome you to the webinar today uh, where our distinguished guest is uh, a great friend of the foundation, Her Excellency Leonpo Dechen Wangmo, the Minister of Health. Um, under the leadership of His Majesty and the Prime Minister, um, Leonpo Dechen has been a formidable force in uh, Bhutan's response to the coronavirus pandemic. We also have in today's webinar um, one of our uh, most uh, important partners, the Dean of the Yale School of Public Health, Dr. Sten Fairmont. Um, let me begin by giving you a short introduction of Bhutan Foundation. We are a U.S.-based nonprofit uh, with offices in Washington, D.C. and in Timpu in Bhutan. Our programs are aligned with the core values of Bhutan's uh, national philosophy of gross national happiness, uh, which as His Majesty the King describes it, is really development with values. Through all our programs, we, are support, we support building professional Bhutanese capacity and facilitating global partnerships. Our task is really to support the work of our partners on the ground in Bhutan. And here's a list you can see many of them. Um, and we work with numerous government uh, agencies, but also the non-governmental non CSOs in Bhutan. Um, based on capacity gaps that we see in Bhutan, we like to bring in international partner organizations from US and around the world. Um, and these foster special relationships like the one we have with the Yale School of Public Health and uh, our counterpart Bhutanese agencies. We provide a, a wide array of expertise um, from emergency medicine to special education, sustainable buildings, environmental con conservation, and resilient communities where we support currently four communities around Bhutan. Let me just give you a quick overview of what Bhutan Foundation has been doing the last couple of months to work with the government and other local partners on the uh, COVID response. Um, we've worked with many uh, organizations. Uh, we've moved all of our uh, programs online for virtual distance uh, and socially distanced training. Um, we've donated PPE to the Ministry of Health through a large shipment with our partner in the US called MedShare. Uh, and this went uh, around all around Bhutan. We've also been working with USAID uh, on two important projects. Um, one uh, uh, around to enhance and strengthen food security and employment as a result of pandemic. Um, and also working with the Ministry of Health to require equipment and training needed uh, during this important time. Also with our co-chair, Her Majesty Queen Mother Sring Pem Wanchuk, um, Bhutan Foundation has donated $170,000 to its Majesty's COVID relief fund. These programs support the economically disadvantaged families during the pandemic time and unemployed youth. So that just gives you a quick overview of the kind of things that Bhutan Foundation is doing and specifically how we have helped during the pandemic. Now I wanna turn it over to our distinguished guests. I'll start by introducing Dr. Sten Vermund, the Dean of Yale School of Public Health. He's also uh, the Anna Lauder Professor of Public Health of Epidemiology of Microbial Diseases and the Professor of Pediatrics at the Yale School of Medicine. He's an infectious disease epidemiologist and pediatrician focused on diseases of low and middle income countries and on health disparities in the US. Dr. Vermont's research has focused on healthcare access, adolescent medicine, prevention of mother to child HIV transmission, and reproductive health. As with many others at Yale, his recent work has focused on the COVID-19 pandemic. So with that, I'll turn things over to Dr. Vermont. Thank you, Michael. Can everyone hear me okay? 
you can nod, Michael, if you can hear me. I can hear you. Brilliant. Okay, just double checking. So thank you very much. Uh, without the Bhutan Foundation, I'm not sure that Yale School of Public Health would be able to work in uh, uh, Bhutan in any effective way because Bhutan Foundation helps us at every turn from guidance to um, uh, concrete assistance, and we're very grateful. Um, we have uh, two phases of collaboration that we thought we would highlight for you. One started in 2012 and uh, sort of went to 2016. Uh, the training focus was public health education and teaching, uh, and uh, we had semester-long fellowships at the Yale School of Public Health, and we were uh, privileged to have six Bhutanese uh, uh, scholars to join us in that time period. And more recently, in the past five years, uh, we've been working on enhancing research and scholarship capacity building, uh, and we've been targeting our short-term trainings in Bhutan itself. So uh, the six Bhutanese faculty who trained at Yale School of Public Health in these semester-long fellowships are um, current contacts of ours and collaborators of ours, current leaders in, uh, in the nation. The health research capacity building uh, includes um, uh, the uh, priority setting workshops, uh, both with the university and with the Ministry of Health. Uh, this um, uh, access is critical because in a country like Bhutan, uh, the university uh, wants to be as useful and helpful as it possibly can be to further the health of it, the people of the nation. Um, and in the case of the ministry, it wants the efficiency of an academic enterprise to, um, to sort of take co-ownership of vital educational and capacity building efforts. Uh, we did a grant writing workshop in 2015. We've had a workshop on um, mosquito and sand fly surveillance uh, for vector-borne control and prevention research. And we also had our Yale School of Public Health librarian, uh, Kate Nyan, um, assessing opportunities for uh, information uh, access, uh, literacy in accessing information from the global web, and capacity building. Here's one, uh, a nice uh, sort of uh, a photo of, um, of, of one of our uh, workshops. To highlight the workshops on research methods and proposal development, uh, we actually ask our trainees to develop a research proposal in the workshop, very concrete. We had a methods emphasis in 2016. We worked on small grant awards in 2017, survey methodology in 2018, and then we had a special uh, effort in 2019 on research ethics for uh, IRB members. And uh, my colleague uh, uh, Kave Kushnud has been deeply engaged in all of these endeavors um, uh, and uh, other faculty who are devoted to the uh, partnership in Bhutan. Um, now, these are, this is a list of the collaborative research projects. Rather than my reading them uh, in detail, I'll just say malaria surveillance, uh, the practice of nursing, uh, maternal oral health, um, early childhood caries, um, the research capacity of community service organizations, and um, emergency care systems. Just to give you a sense of what our Bhutanese colleagues have prioritized for the uh, research that they would like to spearhead. We were uh, happy to see such topics as as nursing and oral health added to these other agenda because uh, these are sometimes not uh, highlighted and uh, we all know how utterly vital they are. Now, uh, the Bhutan Health Journal 
uh, is an exciting initiative. You see Mayor Desai to the left there from our um, school uh, working with his Bhutanese counterpart. You see some of the uh, members of the editorial board in the center the, and authors, reviewers, uh, and then Kave serves as their international editor. Just to highlight three publications that emerged from uh, these research collaborations, I mentioned Malaria Surveillance, and that was published back in uh, uh, 2016 in the journal Frontiers in Public Health. Uh, you'll see the um, methodology and criteria of setting uh, research priorities. Um, um, that workshop report published last year in the Bhutan Health Journal. And, uh, and you'll see um, also uh, the evaluating effects of village health workers on, uh, on hospital admission rates and their economic impact published, published in the BMC Public Health uh, Journal just this year. I should mention that that involves um, a wide a variety of Bhutanese and uh, US collaborators including uh, students, including faculty, including Ministry of Health. So just to um, highlight that uh, Bhutan Foundation obviously has a much wider array of collaborators than we do, but in this um, effort to assist in research, capacity building, public health education, uh, improvements, enhancements, uh, and in the uh, Bhutan Health Journal and many other activities, uh, we have a variety of partners. And Utah, UCSF, uh, Cornell, Harvard, uh, the Northwell Health Systems, particularly Phelps Hospital, health volunteers overseas and critical data are among them. And uh, we are very pleased uh, that uh, we can play a role in pulling these groups together. Mary Alice has been very active. We've got a whole host of uh, folks dedicated and keen to expand our Bhutanese uh, partnerships. I have not yet had the privilege to go to Bhutan. Uh, plans that were being made uh, were coveted and uh, that had to be deferred, but I'm welcoming my opportunity to take advantage of a South Asian trip and, uh, and go to Bhutan for substantial uh, consultations. And there we have uh, Kate and Mary Alice and Kave with a wide swath of Bhutanese collaborators. Uh, this uh, alumni gathering in Thimphu uh, was very exciting for us to see some of the folks who have um, come to Yale as well as some of the folks we've worked with uh, most closely in Bhutan. So I think the next steps in our partnership, uh, we would like to ask some of these questions and perhaps have that uh, be part of the rest of this hour. What capacity building does the university and the Ministry of Health need? Um, what is the uh, Yale School of Public Health expertise that can help in this capacity building? And if we don't have the expertise, the um, partners that I just showed you on the previous slide almost certainly do, uh, one of them anyway, and uh, how do we pull that together? What high impact scientific studies can be conducted to help the people of Bhutan and the world? Because of course, something we find in Bhutan may be relevant to the rest of South Asia and beyond. And then how are we going to secure the funds to make these dreams a reality? So this concludes my um, a brief presentation, and I'm very honored to um, uh, introduce Her Excellency, um, the um, um, uh, Bhutanese Yale School of Public Health alumna and Bhutan's Ministry of Health, Her Excellency Liangpo Dechen Wangmo. Her Excellency formally took charge of Bhutan's Ministry of Health in November of 2018 and uh, had more than 10 years of experience working in eight countries across Southeast Asia in the field of public health and social development. Her experience includes public health research development and implementation, 
national policy review and formulation, and also development of strategic plans for both government and civil society organizations. She founded and was, is the former executive director of the Bhutan Cancer Society. She is also the founding chairperson of Laksam, a civil society organization dedicated to people living with HIV AIDS. Her primary focus over the years has been in developing and strengthening health systems and governments. And without further ado, I turn it over to Her Excellency uh, and welcome her presentation to us today. Sound is not working, lah. Yeah. Am I audible now? Yes, lah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Siling. Plus, uh, 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 to everyone, um, everyone watching um, this webinar today. I want to thank Michael for the introduction, um, and I'm really honored uh, and privileged always to be part of that institution, Bhutan Foundation. Um, you, are, you guys are doing some amazing work in Bhutan, and, and, and my highest uh, appreciation. Um, and of course, uh, Dr. Stein, it is wonderful to see you vi uh, virtually. Uh, Nevertheless, um, my, my highest uh, appreciation um, um, to the Yale family. Um, I have spent many years there um, and I really, I, I am very appreciative of what I have learned um, at the Yale School of Public Health. The connections that I have made, um, I really think that was a place where I have learned uh, to think about global issues, but, but also to act locally and, and, and really contextualize issues uh, to, to where you come from. Um, the skills, the competencies that I have learned um, today as, as we um, go forward in terms of managing this pandemic, I find it very, very useful. So um, it was wonderful to see Mary Alice and Kave and uh, bring, bring back some beautiful memories of uh, spending uh, my time at Yale. So uh, thank you again uh, for the introduction. Uh, so with further ado, um, I would like to go into my presentation. So, um, Yes. So this is what you see on the screen um, uh, is, is really uh, what is guiding the Bhutan's intervention uh, of this, this pandemic. Um, this is a quote from His Majesty's first national address given on the 22nd of March 2020, uh, which basically, if I may quote His Majesty, we must exhibit the strength that comes out of our smallness remain united and support one another. During such exceptional circumstances, the government will take the responsibility of alleviating suffering to the people due to this virus. Um, I really wanted to look, um, um, drive your attention at the smallness. You know, we are indeed a small nation that is wedged uh, between the two giants. We have um, 
China in our north with 1.39 billion population. Uh, we have India in our south uh, with 1.35 billion uh, population and we are a 700,000 population. Um, if you look at it uh, geographically, China is about 9.6 million square kilometers. Uh, India is about 3.3 million kilometers uh, and Bhutan is uh, barely 30, 39,000 uh, square kilometer. So really, I, we took the, the smallness as our biggest strength. And when I say that, um, if we look at uh, when we started our journey, um, I think it was um, on the 15th of January, uh, barely 15 days after the Wuhan incident, we instituted um, in our point of entries at the airport, we started our screening at the point of entry at uh, the Paro Airport, Paro International Airport. And on the 31st of Jan, uh, exactly one month after the Wuhan incident, uh, we activated our emer health emergency system. And of course, on the 5th of March, we had our first case, uh, COVID case, which was an um, a American tourist who came to visit Bhutan. And um, on the 11th of March, that was when WHO declared uh, COVID-19 as an, as an pandemic. But right after that, on the 16th of March, uh, we made mandatory quarantine, uh, facility quarantine. So government announced that every individual who will come to Bhutan will be quarantined in a designated quarantine facility. So, um, and then following which on the 22nd of March, um, His Majesty the King uh, gave his first address to the nation. And that of course provided a lot of guidance uh, to uh, how we, uh, how uh, Bhutan's interventions uh, will be designed. Uh, and of course on the 23rd of March, uh, we closed all our international borders. Um, 8th uh, of April, of course, we uh, did our first serological test. Uh, we started doing serological tests on the 8th of uh, uh, April. Um, unfortunately, till then, the most of the COVID cases were imported. So people who were coming back from uh, different countries uh, into Bhutan. Uh, unfortunately, on the 10th of August, we had our first community case, a case that was not from importation, but from within community. We had a single case and on the 11th, we announced a national lockdown of 21 days. But during which we already detected more than 121 positive cases uh, during the 21 day lockdown period. And then of course, um, after um, demarcating and identifying uh, the risk areas on the 1st of September, we started our unlocking phase. But then the, un the uniqueness of the unlocking phase was that, that uh, you know, we learned a lot from people who have unlocked and in, 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 in unlocking experience in many countries. And we realized that for a small nation like ours, we have to be very, very cautious. So our unlocking was done in a phase manner so that we have a lot of control uh, on, on the containment of the, of the disease itself. Um, as of now, uh, as of now, we have 245 confirmed case. This is since our first case detection on the 4th, uh, 5th of ma March. And we have 84 people uh, who are uh, active cases. And we have 161 recovered with zero mortality. In terms of where we stand globally, we have uh, we are around 317 case per million population, mortality zero till now. Testing we stands 45 in, in uh, globally with almost 152,000 tests uh, per million um, population. Um, so this graph that you see um, uh, is the projection of cases in hospitalization. So early on, what we did was that we really planned a worst case scenario. 
given that we have a fairly a premature health system and seeing what was happening around the world where this uh, pandemic has managed to collapse many of the health systems we realize that we have to be very proactive in terms of projecting our cases and being prepared uh, for handling the worst case scenario so if you look at that, the projection indicates a total projection of uh, 41,758 cases. And then we divided uh, the case scenario based on, on four COVID centers. So early on, we established geographically uh, four COVID centers, one in the south, uh, uh, the other one in the central, the other one in the east, and then in the capital, which has almost uh, one fourth of the population in, in the catchment area of the cap, uh, capital city. So uh, this was fairly, this, this was the framework that really guided in terms of our planning. Um, so, so this is what uh, going forward, we said, if we have a community transmission, we need to have a community mitigation strategy. And, and, and we took inspiration from, of course, the pillars of GNH, the four pillars of GNH. So we said, why can't we have four pillars in, in uh, community transmission mitigation strategy? And we realized this first one was really test, to test. And this was really focusing on enha enhancing accessibility and availability of test. Um, and then the second one was really building our surveillance system. And the third one was really looking at the medical search capacity. Uh, we have barely have 3,000 health workers in the country. So we have to very, be very judicious in, in terms of allocating our health human resources. Uh, and of course, the fourth one was really focusing on behavior change. And that was to really um, empowering people and communities to make uh, and adopt uh, public health measures. So we felt that um, through these four major uh, strategies uh, that we will be able to prevent and contain the spread of COVID-19 and, and uh, minimize social and economic disruption in the country. Now, if we look at our testing, um, when we started um, um, in March, we had only one um, laboratory in, in, um, uh, in the capital. And we realized that we had to make RT-PCR tests available in all our region. So uh, as of now, we have four more additional laboratories that are established throughout the countries. So you can see that uh, the red dots are all the um, uh, RT-PCR laboratories that have been established in the country. Um, and then, then we said uh, we need to make at least uh, uh, serological testing available in, in all our health facilities. So uh, then we uh, supplied and enhanced uh, uh, testing facilities in almost 54 health facilities across the country. So now in the most remotest part of Bhutan, they should be able to get an antigen test done right away within 30 minutes and be able to get the results. Um, if we look at um, our national testing protocol, so at the point of entry, so anybody who is arriving uh, at the point of entry, if they have signs and symptoms, we do our RT-PCR right away. Um, if for patients and attendants, uh, Bhutan's health system, we refer a lot of patients uh, to India for, for tertiary level care. Uh, we realized when we bought them back, uh, we test them, all of them, at, at the point of entry. And then during the quarantine period, um, um, everybody, anybody who has symptoms, who are symptomatic, are picked up and RT-PCR is done on them. And then at the end of 21-day quarantine, so this is 21-day quarantine plus a testing. So at the end of 21-day uh, quarantine, we do an antibody test uh, for, for everyone who completes quarantine. Uh, so similarly, something that we have, we have realized um, uh, during our community transmission is that we have to protect our health facilities. We have to have a good containment protocol for our health facilities so that our health facilities do not become 
uh, a hub for infection. So this is where we realized um, that all major hospitals, we wanted to have a containment protocol. So with no exceptions, the picture you see over there is the prime minister who you all know is a surgeon. And um, almost every Saturday, he goes out uh, to, to perform surgeries. So even he has to go through uh, an antigen testing before he enters uh, the hospital premises. Um, every patient that is admitted uh, and the attendant are tested. Um, OPT and IPT team and mobile teams are all uh, self-contained model. So which means there is no mixing between these teams. And on, on two, uh, every 14 days, we test all our frontliners. So our biggest objective or aspiration that we are striving for is zero COVID infection among our health worker. Um, so this is where we put a lot of emphasis, uh, realizing a lot of health workers are getting infected globally. Uh, we have put in a lot of effort in, in, in containing uh, uh, and preventing our health workers from getting infected. Now, if you look at the trace mechanism, the second strategy, which is basically to enhance um, surveillance, uh, both active and passive surveillance. Even prior to getting our first case, that is before March 5th, we have been testing all our Surrey and ILI samples across the country. So every patient that is admitted in the hospital with acute respiratory infections were tested through our surveillance system. This was prior to us having our first case. Then we realized we had to have a very active community surveillance and this is done by our local health worker, the village health worker, Dr. Stein, you were mentioning. Um, so they, they have become a very critical component to this and, and the local government. So anybody that, when we, whenever we do an active community surveillance, this is where we engage the local government and our local health worker um, in the districts. Um, then we have, um, schools and institution uh, surveillance system. So where we, any organization that has more than 15 people working for them, we, identify, we have asked them to identify a COVID focal person, a COVID safety focal person. And they are the bridge between the Ministry of Health and the institution or the community. So they are tasked with um, uh, monitoring safety in the, in the institution, plus informing Ministry of Health on any symptoms that comes in, um, uh, in, in the institutions. And similarly, the same arrangement is being uh, made in schools as well. Um, so they report through our early warning system, the NUAS information system you see is our existing early warning system. Um, then, of course, we realized given uh, Bhutan is very small, uh, people are very mobile and, and, and the disease can spread uh, because of mobility of the people. We identified mobile population and one of the high risk population and that we developed a COVID integrated influenza surveillance system and during which uh, every mobile, most of the mobile population along the high risk area are tested on a regular basis. So we randomly select a mobile population and conduct testing on them to ensure that there is no pocket of community transmission that is happening without us being aware. Um, and then the third one is, of course, um, our passive surveillance that are uh, health facility based. So anybody with a flu-like symptoms are all tested um, uh, through uh, by the health worker and, and also through the flu uh, clinic. So early on in our uh, pandemic, we established around 54 standalone flu clinics where people could access um, uh, flu services plus uh, COVID testing um, as well. Um, this is a typical example of, of, of what we do. Uh, this, this uh, if I may, uh, this is a, a place in, in the southern part of uh, the country. The yellow dotted line you see is our international boundaries. 
And we realized that when we um, had a community outbreak there, we need to identify and stage uh, the containment area. So this whole area that is red uh, um, and the numbers actually identify the clusters uh, where the positive cases came out from. So this whole area has been contained and defined as red zone. So we have certain protocols uh, for the red zone. And then the, when these red zones are contained, the rest of the uh, area, people can go on with their lives. Um, so that's a strategy that we have adopted in terms of staging um, the risks um, um, of, of COVID transmission. And the moment we have that, we uh, put in an aggressive testing protocol there. Um, as of now, um, uh, the biggest challenge uh, for Bhutan is, is mending its 700-kilometer uh, porous border. Uh, that has been a huge challenge, and, and it continues to be a huge challenge for us. And there are very, very close um, communities uh, living together, socially connected. Uh, so that's uh, one of our biggest challenge. Um, and then if you look at TREAT, um, we are, I think, uh, what we follow is we follow a uh, uh, testing-based discharge. So no patient is discharged without having tested twice negative and 14-day de-isolation and then test, antibody test. Then only the patient is released uh, from the hospital. As of now, both symptomatic and asymptomatic are managed in the hospital. We try to take their baseline um, uh, vitals um, and then monitor them um, throughout their stay. Uh, the other wheel, that four wheel you see, is we have four COVID centers that we have, um, uh, and then the health and the health, additional health resources that will come in from these various uh, hospitals. So for now, we have identified if we do have an outburst of case in a specific COVID center, the additional health human resource will come from these uh, defined uh, health facilities and the districts. So this is a backup plan that, uh, that we have developed in case we get uh, overwhelming cases. Um, and of course, going to our last pillar, which is really focusing on, on behavior change. Uh, behavior change uh, primarily through really empowerment of the communities, engaging the communities so that people take additional uh, personal responsibility of, of basic things like washing your hands, wearing masks, um, uh, doing physical distancing, all that. Um, and this is done in partnership with uh, the local communities, identifying local champions in the communities, and then also partnering up with uh, local government and the CSOs who have been actively um, uh, campaigning for, uh, for prevention of COVID-19. So there is a whole multimedia campaign. Uh, the logo you see in the center is, is a multi overarching multimedia campaign called Our Genku, which is our responsibility translates to art responsibility and, and, and the vision or the theme there is responding to the call of the nation. Uh, this is really focusing on taking personal responsibility uh, for your action to, to, to really protect uh, not only yourself but nation at large. Now, uh, what has worked uh, for Bhutan? Um, I, I don't want to call it a success story because the battle is still ongoing. Um, I think we have miles to go. Um, so, so far, I think reflecting on uh, what is working for us, uh, uh, this uh, cartoon uh, depicts it very well. It is really uh, the collective effort uh, of everyone, every member of the society um, and, and every sector uh, really coming together with the singular goal of preventing COVID-19. Um, at the hem of it is, is of course, uh, the benevolent leadership of His Majesty the King. Um, His Majesty, um, even during the preparatory plan, uh, 
uh, months uh, in January, His Majesty has traveled length and breadth of the country, uh, going uh, to visiting the southern borders multiple times to, to not only communicate with people, but also to, to encourage uh, our health workers, frontline workers, armies, police, everybody who are managing our borders, who are uh, working tirelessly and being in the forefront. Um, and, and if you look at uh, the other picture is, is one of, uh, is a hospital in the eastern part of the country, Mongar uh, Regional Referral Hospital. And, and during His Majesty's visit there, uh, His Majesty uh, offered uh, the Royal Guest House to be converted into COVID hospital. Um, and this gesture only highlights uh, the compassion His Majesty has for uh, his people. Um, and, and also, you know, upon the command of His Majesty that no Bhutanese, doesn't matter where they are, should, should not suffer from COVID. Uh, the government, upon the command of His Majesty, started the repatriation flight. And uh, till date, we have had uh, 42 repatriation flight and brought home almost 4,000 individuals from 11 different countries. Um, and of course, um, um, you know, something that uh, we all know now is that uh, COVID is, uh, is beyond health. It has uh, uh, economically impacted uh, the world very badly. And, and uh, Bhutan is no exception. Um, we have uh, um, our tourism industry is been is been very badly hit. So um, our um, hotel industry is very badly hit. Um, so His Majesty on the 14th uh, of April launched uh, the Drukelpo's Kidu Relief Fund, which provided uh, financial support to more than 23,000 individuals and families uh, to at least. Um, 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 mitigate uh, the economic uh, hardship. Um, and of course, uh, something that is also, again, very, very admirable for every Bhutanese. And I think um, I, it's fair to say that on behalf of every Bhutanese people, we feel truly blessed uh, to have His Majesty because um, I think even, um, you know, his, through His Majesty's uh, program, uh, His Majesty early on reached uh, almost every elderly people in the country with care packages, um, you know, included vitamins, soaps, you know, uh, people who couldn't, uh, who had economic challenges were all taken care and really protected the vulnerable population. Um, so much so that, uh, you know, every, um, it, uh, His Majesty's care packages has reached every corner of the country. Um, second, of course, is, is in times of crisis, um, something that, of course, worked very well is having a good organizational structure so that you have a chain of command um, uh, during emergency. Um, so in, in case of Bhutan, we have a national COVID uh, task force, which is headed by prime minister um, and four um, uh, nominated member uh, uh, on the national task force and then the country is divided into three regions and three regions have regional task force members who are um, then looks after the respective um, districts. So this is the command that we follow and, and for everything health, uh, we have the health emergency management uh, com committee that is being consulted and, and uh, within that structure we have the technical advisory group that actually technically guides the whole of the national response. So it is really an, an example of, of, of a multi-sectoral approach uh, to, to addressing um, this pandemic. So if you look at the representation um, mm -hmm. at the regional task force, we have the local government, we have army, we have police, we have uh, civil servant, private sectors. Um, so all the sectors uh, are actively engaged um, and the governors, they are all engaged and forms the, the, the regional task force. The second um, 
uh, thing that worked for us, we feel, is public solidarity and dedication. Um, and that is something that, uh, you know, um, if, if you look at uh, the monastic institution, monastic institution under the leadership of the chief abbot um, has, has performed uh, various uh, rituals and, and prayers for well-being of humanity, not just for Bhutan, but for everyone who has who is suffering and who have suffered and who have passed away because of COVID-19. So there is a continuous prayers happening in all the religious institution across the country in all 20 districts. And, and then coming forward to support Ministry of Health in terms of providing guidance, providing being the champion of public health, advocating for public health measures. Uh, Chief Abbott, I remember on, uh, in the, during the early days, uh, you know, he came up with a public message saying, you must listen to, uh, to what Ministry of Health has to say and, and abide by what they are saying. Uh, that was the biggest, uh, really, um, it really greatly helped um, our own public health measures uh, that we were trying to disseminate to public. And then, of course, um, people you see over there, the orange, uh, people in orange dress, these are our day soups, these are our national volunteers. So uh, started almost 10 years ago, um, when we, uh, prior to the COVID-19, uh, we had only 4,000 uh, day soups. And during the last uh, few months, we have managed to train over 10,387 day soup and we continue to train our volunteers. And these people guarding the borders for months, they don't even get paid a penny. This is completely voluntary. Uh, people have come forward from all walks of life uh, to really answer to the call of the nation. Um, very, very admirable. But um, similarly, the villagers who um, you know, um, um, could not contribute in, in cash, uh, made contribution in kind. Uh, they, they donated their vegetables, their produce uh, to the government so we could feed people in quarantine. Um, and, and moreover, uh, when we started the COVID uh, uh, response fund, um, almost 106 million uh, uh, new towns were donated uh, by many, many individuals. And I can never forget uh, the lady who donated uh, 25 new um, That's about a quarter, I think, uh, US dollar. <laughs> so she called me up and she said, you know, I wish I had more I want to contribute. Uh, but for now, I have only 25 new um, But um, I know what the country is going through and I would like to make that contribution. And these, I think these are, these are moments uh, we will continue to cherish and um, continue to remember um, uh, and really contribute towards uh, this epidemic. Now, this is my last slide. And, and I was thinking, uh, as when I was doing the slides, I was thinking, should I say challenges? Should I say, you know, what way forward? Then I realized we must say road ahead. <laughs> Um, and, and the road ahead, uh, we really wanted to, as a nation, we wanted to focus on three things. Uh, one is health security. You know, when we, when the earlier, the technical working group that I mentioned, you know, when we uh, early on during the epidemic, we realized, okay, let's look at what kind of capacity we have in a country. And I asked the civil servant uh, director, I said, can you give me a list of people who has PhDs and MPH and in, in health epidemiology? That list was very, very short. Um, and we realized that there are very few people um, in the country. And, and when we were talking about uh, managing a critical care patient, we realized we have only one um, ICU trained physician you know, uh, um, and then we realize, you know, we just don't have enough specialists. And, and, and I think going forward, we would really uh, like to focus 
on, on health security. Um, given the biggest mandate of the current government, uh, which is the health, um, building the health system, uh, we realize it is a very fertile ground uh, to cultivate and invest um, in building health security. Um, second, of course, is social security. Um, in terms of protecting the most vulnerable uh, people in the community. Uh, Bhutan, of course, um, with, with uh, guidance from uh, His Majesty the King and the Prime Minister, uh, we were the only country in Southeast Asia region to not to have any disruption of our regular health services. Um, but if the battle continues and if the case becomes worse, I think that is going to be the most challenging um, task for Ministry of Health to face. Um, so we realize that at the most, at least we must be able to take care of the most vulnerable section of our community. Um, if we look at poverty data, 8% of 700,000 is just a handful of people. But we realize that we must have good systems in place so that we are able to take care of that 8%. Um, then, of course, the last one is economic uh, security. Um, we are an import-driven um, country. We are not a big economy. We are barely, uh, we are a small economy, uh, import-driven. We realize everything that we eat to what we wear is, is imported. Um, um, how do we evolve from it? You know, we have three major sector that contributes to the go uh, government's revenue. Well, hydropower is one, tourism is the second one, and the manufacturing is the third uh, 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 revenue generator. Uh, we realize, um, except for the hydropower, tourism is badly affected. It is as good as, as not having it. Um, from royalty itself, we make about 15 billion a year, and that revenue now is no longer there. Uh, second, uh, manufacturing and uh, industries, that has been hampered because we just don't have the human resources at the moment. So most of our human resources are imported. So we get our labor from outside. Um, so that has been the biggest challenge. So then, then we realize that we have to focus on economic security. So, so going forward, um, um, we as a government, uh, we really want to want to uh, uh, look at technology, innovation, um, and partnership uh, to to really address uh, the, these three uh, securities, the health, the social security, and the economic uh, security. So I hope that, um, that we will uh, be able to foster long-term relationship with our partners um, and really build uh, so that, as His Majesty said during his, his national address, that uh, at the end of this pandemic, uh, Bhutan should and must come out as the resilient nation who uh, will, will uh, so we hope and pray uh, that, um, uh, that uh, um, what we have put forward uh, will uh, be a reality and, and, and we are very committed uh, to, to, to really coming out of this as a resilient and more united uh, nation. So Tashi Dele. Thank, thank you, Your Excellency. Um, we have a very short time uh, left for some questions, but there have been some important questions that have come up. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, to go through a couple of them. Um, one is uh, Yale has just come up with a saliva testing for COVID. Can this be made available for Bhutan? And that could be for either uh, the Our Excellency or uh, Dr. Sten. Why don't I make a quick comment? Uh, this is a, a simpler and cheaper uh, and faster uh, test. Uh, of course, saliva is an appealing um, bodily fluid, much easier than the NP swab. And one does not require um, a health, uh, trained health worker to obtain it. So we are keen to uh, launch it uh, 
globally and Bhutan would be an excellent partner. Mm -hmm. um, it, the, one of the big advantages is um, lopping off a couple of steps, avoiding the need for special tubes or reagents and uh, maintaining uh, sensitivity despite this uh, simplification. We think that the reagents will be costing between one and a half dollars to four dollars per test. Uh, so one can see how um, the dream of a test for under, under ten dollars uh, could be uh, a reality uh, if one had uh, volume and, um, and uh, uh, perhaps subsidized uh, laboratory uh, labor. Um, we have an emergency use authorization from the FDA, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Uh, however, there's nothing stopping us from training international uh, partners. Uh, it can be used on any PCR platform. Uh, so that's one of its big advantages. You don't have to go buy an expensive kit from a particular company. And really, our technique is a procedure. Um, so please contact me uh, for um, uh, further uh, linkage to Nathan Grubaugh and Ann Wiley, who are the inventors and are marshalling the response. Okay, great. Uh, this one is for the... Minister, what plans are being made to obtain the COVID vaccine for Bhutan once it is available? I think for now we are working with the COVAX facility, which is a collaboration with the Gavi and WHO. Um, so we are um, lobbying with, uh, with COVAX uh, to secure uh, vaccine. As of now, there, are, um, there has been uh, communication that uh, uh, they will probably support 20% uh, of our population. And that, of course, would be our, our frontliners and our health workers. Okay. Uh, here's one, a question from R. Morrow. Good evening, Your Excellency. As the first child specialist in Bhutan in 1983, Three at the former TGH, I have a particular interest in children in Bhutan, children of Bhutan. With Bhutan's young age population, are there any special considerations you're taking in your clinical or epidemiological preparations? Uh, I think um, as of now, we had um, three uh, uh, positive children. Um, and they, they have been managed uh, as, as adults, uh, but, but in terms of our advocacy materials, we are targeting um, uh, children. For example, we are coming up with uh, child-friendly um, advocacy materials for them. And then also the biggest uh, uh, services that we are providing, even in case of a lockdown, is our antenatal care and immunization packages. Uh, continue, we, we are still continuing our MTH services um, and immunization services for our children. But no specific, um, I think, clinical arrangements uh, um, are there in terms of the protocol as of now, uh, as I understand. Okay, um, here's one from Richard Seisman. A One Health strategy was approved a few years ago with the assistance of several UN agencies. What has happened with respect to concrete and coordinated steps to deal with human, animal, environmental health? Um, I think one, one Health is, is an agenda that the Ministry of Health is very, very passionate about. And, and the technical advisory group that I was talking about earlier is, is also, uh, most of the members are also part of the One Health uh, program. Uh, we are now within the national laboratory. Uh, we are trying to build up the One Health uh, program and strengthen the One Health program there. Uh, we do have uh, uh, support from uh, Fleming's Fund at the moment to, to build the capacity um, of uh, people who are uh, part of the One Health team. Okay. Here's one from Kave. Uh, <laughs> Bhutan's COVID-19 response has been comprehensive, evidence-based, and compassionate. Did Bhutan already have an outbreak preparedness plan before COVID-19 hit? 
Um, my, my best regards to Kavi first. <laughs> um, yes, we did. We, uh, we do have a, a health emergency program within the medical, uh, within the Ministry of Health. And, and interestingly, I think uh, um, in November, uh, we had uh, a simulation exercise uh, by this program, and they did a simulation on, on coronavirus. Uh, so that was quite a coincidence, uh, but but yes, we do have an emergency um, health program. Great. Here's one from Liz Garman. Um, what challenges has the ministry faced working with the general public on accepting COVID-19 related re restrictions, and how has the ministry responded to those challenges? Um, I think not in particular in terms of health, but I think accessing health services, uh, especially during lockdown. Um, uh, this was, uh, people must understand, we, we are a country that uh, this is the first time that we have ever gone through lockdown. Uh, so that uh, that uh, was uh, was a, a big challenge in itself because you know having to deal with restrictions, uh, Bhutanese are not used to dealing with restriction. So there's lots of psychological stress um, that comes with restriction. Uh, so more of these issues than and and then of course having access to essential commodities and delivering and all uh, those were some major major challenges. Um, uh, in, in our case, especially um, at delivering our normal um, health services. Okay, let's do two more questions. One from Pema Gyamsho. Uh, what is the most critical assistance that the Ministry of Health is looking for during this critical and unprecedented time? Um, I think, I think, like I said, it's it's really in the long term, short term, right now, immediately is is we don't produce anything in the country. So, so access to uh, to PPEs, um, access to medicine, access to vaccine, immediate need, long term need, investing in our health system, building the capacity and the competency of our health worker, health researchers, um, having institutional linkages so that we are able to bank on having a technical backup, backstopping services um, if, if we ever face a second pandemic. Uh, so these are some of the short-term and the long-term uh, needs, I guess. Okay. So here's the last question from uh, Hannah Ingber. Many thanks for your presentation today. I am curious what Ministry of Health priorities may be helped in the future by the extensive work that you did to limit COVID-19, for example, monitoring of health or increasing access to care for vulnerable populations, and which priorities may be negatively impacted, for example, maternal, oral health, or other programs? How is the ministry thinking about this? I, I think in terms of COVID, I think um, we have give, accorded uh, the highest priority to the continuation of our essential health services. Um, but of course, when we focus more on that, we then have to deprioritize, um, say, elective surgeries, um, elective procedures, but that do have an impact on the quality of life of an individual. So I think that is that is that was the biggest uh, challenge in terms of balancing and prioritizing. You know, uh, once we prioritize essential services, then we have to discontinue a lot of non-essential services. And then the non-essential services ultimately does impact uh, at the individual level. Uh, so that has been the most uh, challenging aspect, I guess. Right, understood. What, one last question that I missed. Um, to what do you do attribute the zero morbidity rate among those infected within the population? Uh, I think um, two factors that I can think of right now. Uh, one is early detection. Uh, through our enhanced surveillance, early detection, um, detecting people early on, rather than we have a lot of case detection detected that are even asymptomatic, and they become symptomatic few days into uh, 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 the isolation period. So we realize that we are picking up the epidemic way ahead 
uh, um, early on rather than waiting for them to have all the signs and symptoms and then go from house to a, on, on a ventilator. So that has not happened. Um, second, of course, demographically, uh, demographically, most of our positive patients are young, healthy uh, individuals. Um, third, of course, is, is, uh, is the care, the level of care and consultation that happens. Uh, so moment uh, patients are isolated, we take their baseline vitals, we, take, we do all their blood work, x-ray, everything is done. And then the doctor provides really comprehensive care. Literally every single case, even if they're asymptomatic, is discussed so that we don't leave any stone unturned. Um, and then, of course, third is there has also been a lot of literature on, 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 on the air quality and all that aspect as well. But uh, generally, I think it's, it's, it's uh, the level of care that goes in, the detection and the demographic uh, of the patient. Okay. Thank you very much. So I want to thank everybody uh, that was listening on the call. Uh, we had at one point over 160 participants and most people have stayed with us all the way through. Um, so I want to thank everybody for attending today. I want to especially thank Her Excellency for uh, a great presentation and for spending all this time with us and uh, for our great partner and host, uh, Dr. Sten Verman. So thank you, everybody. Uh, we wish you all well. We wish Bhutan continued uh, good luck and success in dealing with this um, pandemic. And we will do everything on our part to help uh, however we can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.